that, um, <laughs> that's probably one of my favorite videos. Um, it's on YouTube. It's been around for a few years. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, to, it's called It's Not About the Nail, and you can find it uh, very quickly. Uh, <laughs> I feel like every married couple, that's where it should start. Like, uh, premarital counseling begins with this video. We're going to start here and work our way from, from that point. Um, uh, and there's probably a few of you that can maybe feel that a little too realistically this morning. Uh, because in most relationships, I, I think this happens. I think men inherently want to fix problems. Um, the faucet's leaking. What, what do you need to do? You need to fix the faucet. The floor squeaking. Well, you need to fix that. A nail stuck in your wife's forehead? Might need to get that looked at. Uh, it may be a complicated problem, but that doesn't diminish a, that male drive to, to try to fix whatever it is that's broken. Well, and I'd say in this video, the, the, the husband, I assume it's his husband, uh, but I think he's got the problem pretty well dialed in there. Like, I, I think he's got it figured out. But the woman, well, she's less interested in the truth of the situation than she is working through the, the feelings of the situation. <laughs> they're in the same room, but they're definitely not on the same page. Maybe you've been in situations like that before, where you've been in the same room, involved in the same conversation, but definitely not playing from the same sheet of music. In Jeremiah chapter 28 this morning, we find the weeping prophet in a showdown with another man who's also identified as a prophet. His name is Hananiah. And in this situation, in this case, you've got two men. They are looking at the same set of facts. They're in the same room, so to speak, but they're definitely not on the same page. In this case, Jeremiah knows the truth. If he's looking at the woman, he can see the nail in the forehead. But Hananiah, the, the other man, I'll say this, he's just a little less interested in the truth than Jeremiah is. As we get into this text today, I want us to think about how some of the same things today can maybe cloud our understanding of the truth. If you've got your Bibles, we'll be in Jeremiah 28. I'm going to cover the whole chapter, but I'll only read the first nine verses today. If you're able, would you please stand in honor of reading God's Word from Jeremiah 28, beginning there in verse 1. In the same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, Hanani, the son of Azur, the prophet from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all of the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all of the exiles. Yet, hear, this, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war and famine and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for this conflict. I thank you, Lord, that even in this conflict, we can learn some very important lessons and some very important principles to apply in our lives, Lord. May we be men and women who seek after the truth and don't reject it. Bless this time in your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. This morning, I wanna begin by just establishing the timeline. I think that it's easy to get lost in the story. It's easy to, to kind of get lost in the picture. And since the book of Jeremiah is not laid out chronologically, it's easy to get lost about when things are happening. So we've kind of gone back in time just a little bit from a story standpoint. But in 597 BC, the city of Jerusalem came under siege by the king of Babylon. 
At that time, the king Jehoiachin surrendered. He was exiled to Babylon along with many of the well-to-do citizens. They left a generous portion of the population there. They also took a lot of the temple uh, fixtures with them. But the king's uncle, Zedekiah, is appointed as a king, as a puppet king by the Babylonians. But it was still believed, the people still believed that the king who was exiled was the legitimate king. It'd be another 10 or 11 years before Jerusalem would finally be destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. And so it's good to keep that timeline sort of in, in, in mind here. Jeremiah is kind of working in between the, the exile of the Babylonians. The Babylon didn't just come and deport everybody at once. It was kind of a, a process by which they moved everybody out of Jerusalem. And so this chapter moves us away from Jeremiah's preaching and really dials down to some of the conflict that he experiences. As a matter of fact, throughout the rest of the latter half of the book, we get less and less of Jeremiah's preaching and more and more of the, the personal conflicts that he experiences. And here he is having this conflict with Hananiah and these competing prophetic visions of the world. Jeremiah says that it's going to be this way, but Hananiah says it's going to be another way. Now, if you remember from last week, Jeremiah's been kind of in a, in a weird position. He's been preaching, but he's had a yoke around his neck while he's been preaching. He's had a, a wooden yoke that you put around a, a, a set of oxen. He's been wearing this yoke while he has been preaching. And so I know that had to be an awkward thing for Jeremiah to have to do. He put the yoke on when Zedekiah became king. But the fact the chapter begins with these words, in that same year, it implies that some time has actually elapsed. And so this wasn't a one-time thing where Jeremiah put the yoke on, preached his sermon, and then hung it up. He's been wearing it to church every Sunday since. And so you can imagine that's probably pretty awkward. People were probably whispering some things about Jeremiah, just as if I did some things that were unusual. Uh, you might be whispering about me when church was over. You may do that anyway. I don't know. So we might actually call this Jeremiah's yoke era to, uh, to tap into some of the, uh, the, the contemporary conversation. If you weren't here last week, you can go back and listen to last week's sermon, you can catch up. But briefly, the point of the yoke was to tell the nation that their best chance of survival, their best chance to make it through this was to submit to the king of Babylon. That sounds contrary to what you would expect. And, and you know, we, we think, man, you need to rise up against the king. But Jeremiah's like, no. Don't rise up against the king. This is all part of God's plan. You've got to submit yourselves to the king of Babylon. The quickest way to guarantee your destruction is to fight against Babylon. It's one of the great powers of the ancient world. If you want to be destroyed, you fight against Babylon and you are guaranteed destruction. Babylon has already shown its might to the nation. Further resistance would be futile. But Hananiah, this other prophet, he'd had enough. He grew very weary of Jeremiah's doom and gloom preaching. He got tired of seeing that crazy prophet up there with a farm implement around his neck. And he decided that it was his responsibility to inject a little bit of positivity in the room. Jeremiah, you're so hateful. You're so judgment. Everything is, is, is the sky is falling, Jeremiah. We need some, we need some positive messaging. We need to hear a, a positive sermon, Jeremiah. And so right off the bat, we know Hananiah's message is likely to be compromised. There's a little clue in the text. It's easy to miss. We're told that Hananiah was a prophet from Gibeon. You say, that sounds familiar. Why does that sound familiar? And that's because if you know your Bible, you know that Gibeon was first mentioned all the way back in the book of Joshua. And Gibeon was a city-state that should have been judged when Joshua conquered the promised land, but instead they hatched an elaborate scheme to make a treaty with Joshua, and the, that scheme comes to light, and Gibeon is known from that point forward as sort of a, a city-state, a nation of deceivers. They're, you can't trust what they say. They're going to come in and, and cause trouble. You can go back and read about that in Joshua chapter 9. But the point is that since he's a prophet from Gibeon, his preaching might just be a little suspect. You're not sure you can believe everything he says. But Hananiah's message was not the message of doom and gloom that Jeremiah has been preaching. Instead, 
He is preaching a message of good news. Of, uh, it's all wrapped in the flag of Judah. This is good news for our nation. This is good news for our country. Hananiah declared that all of this suffering that we've been enduring, it's going to be over in less than two years. And all the people said, amen. Jeremiah's over here telling us we're doomed. Hananiah says, we've only got two years of this. I want to hear what Hananiah's got to say. I like his message a whole lot better. He said that God was going to return the rightful king to Judah. Hananiah said that all the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar had taken, the king of Babylon, was going to be returned to the temple. You see, Hananiah's words are intended to appeal to the national pride and patriotism of the people. If you're making this into a, an American war movie, you can almost hear Hananiah's words, but in the background, the score changes. Battle Hymn of the Republic begins playing softly, but builds into this great crescendo as Hananiah declares what this message is. People are wiping tears from their cheeks, and Hananiah cries out, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon, as a bald eagle soars overhead. Man, that's moving. That's powerful. I'm stirred. Let me take up arms and fight the king. There's just one problem. It's patently false. It can be moving, and it can call the people to revolt. But if it's based on a lie, it's guaranteed to fail. Jeremiah is over here talking about submitting himself to a foreign pagan king, and Hananiah is over here appealing to breaking, to appealing to the national pride of Israel, of Judah. Hananiah is talking about breaking the yoke of the king, and all of the people of Judah are like, yes, I love what he's got to say. His message is going to be way more popular. His church is going to be way more full because people want to hear this good news. They want to appeal to that national pride. We're going to defeat the king of Babylon, and Jeremiah says, you guys are going to be under his thumb for 70 years. Nobody wants to hear what Jeremiah has to say. Even though what Jeremiah has to say is true. All of this points to the first thing this morning that can cloud our understanding of truth. And it's this. Our national pride, our patriotism, can often cloud our understanding of of truth. Hananiah's message must have resonated to a people who were reeling under the realization that their nation had just surrendered to a foreign king. That would be shocking. If, if, if President Biden came over the news today and said, we have surrendered to the sovereign nation of China because of our debt, and so we have surrendered our, our sovereignty to China, what would you do? You'd be shocked to know that something like that had unfolded. You'd be, you'd be blown away. There'd be, there'd be meetings. There'd be, there'd be call to arms. It'd be a terrifying thing if that were something like that were to, to happen. I don't even think it could happen, but, but you can imagine the, the shock that would take over in our hearts. Under the right set of circumstances, though, Hananiah could have led a rebellion against the king of Babylon right there on the spot. The temple had been violated some of most, her most prized possessions had been looted. The rightful king has been deposed. We're fighting back. Hannah and I could have literally led a rebellion right there that the king of Babylon would have completely and totally crushed. And here's Jeremiah over here listening to all this unfold. He hears this happening. He hears Hananiah's message. He knows it's not true because Jeremiah knows what God has said. And here's Jeremiah over here with a yoke around his neck. <laughs> Hananiah's calling people to arms. He's tapping into their patriotism. Jeremiah's over here acting like a fool with a farm implement around his neck. Jeremiah's been declaring truth from the, from the Lord for a long time. Everybody's heard Jeremiah's message, and there's no way it was a popular message. He's even warned the people that there were prophets and priests that were willing to lie to them. Here's one right now. You know, as Christians, we've always been in a weird place when it comes to our national pride, our patriotism, and our kingdom citizenship. As American citizens, we can and ought to be grateful uh, for the freedoms that God has given to us. 
And we can be grateful that, that our American passport and our kingdom passport are oftentimes not at odds with one another. They can coexist, generally speaking, with relative peace. We are blessed with freedoms and, and tremendous freedoms in this nation. They're not experienced anywhere else in the world. Hopefully we recognize that and celebrate that. But I also think that it's important that we do not allow our patriotism to affect our ability to call a spade a spade. There's no doubt that our hearts swell with pride whenever a speaker or a, a book or, or something recounts the heroic acts of so many over the 248 years of our republic. It is good and proper for us to honor that history. It is good and proper for us to do things like stand when the national anthem is pray, played. It is good and proper for us to do that as responsible citizens of this land. But we must be mindful that we do not allow our love for country to cause us to ignore the wickedness and unrighteousness that has come to characterize so much of our nation today. And I think Jeremiah is very informative for us here. After hearing Hananiah's stirring prophecy, Jeremiah says, amen. Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Jeremiah says, I wish you were right. Some people suggested that he was mocking Hananiah, like, like yeah, right, whatever you say. I've been over here telling everybody the truth. You're lying. Whatever you say, buddy. I don't think that's the case. I think Jeremiah is not a bad citizen. I think he's, he's got a lot of bad news for the nation, but he's not a bad citizen. He looks at Hananiah and says, how I wish you were right. How I wish you were right. How I wish that the glory of this city, how I wish that the glory of this nation could be restored. And I really think that's informative for us today as we look at a nation that seems to be teetering on the brink of some very, very unpleasant realities. We can and we should absolutely pray for our nation. We can and we should absolutely pray for righteous leaders. And listen to me, church, that goes all the way from 101 South Duke Street in Lafayette all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. We ought to be praying for righteous leaders at every one of those addresses. But in our patriotism, may we not neglect our responsibility to call our nation to repent from sin and trust in Christ as Savior. I have no doubt that Jeremiah loved his nation and loved his people. But God made it very clear what he thought about the spiritual condition of that nation. And he had serious words for that nation. And I firmly believe that to be true today as well. Our nation has been far from perfect in her 250 years or so. But... In spite of her imperfections, she has been a beacon for freedom and hope for generations. But hear me in this, any nation that celebrates gross perversion and the slaughter of her children cannot stand. Because those were the very same sins of Israel and Judah. Those nations lasted a very long time and they were given ample grace and a myriad of calls to repent, but there was a tipping point, and Jeremiah is that tipping point. Now today, we can label it however you wanna label it. We can label it progressivism, we can call it liberalism, but at the end of the day, it's a nail stuck in our national forehead. <laughs> we, we talk about all that ails us, but our number one problem is that we have rejected truth and we're running as fast as we can after whatever lies we think will make us feel better. We want to put salve on our consciences without actually dealing with that which has corrupted our consciences. The left thinks it's the right's fault, the right thinks it's the left's fault, and the right likes to point at all the symptoms. They think we can fix the symptoms with elections and laws, but it never gets to the true root of the disease. And as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we had better be about telling the truth. We'd better be about the fact that if we reject God, we will bear the consequences of what happens when generations reject the truth of God. We will bear the consequences of a worldview that says you can only talk about God inside the walls of your churches and places of worship. So what happens next between Jeremiah and Hananiah? Well, it turns out Hananiah is about to catch hands. Did I say that right? Is that right? Okay. About to, there's about to be a fight. What happens? Jeremiah 28, verse 10. 
It says, then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke bars from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke them. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, thus says the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within two years. But Jeremiah the prophet went his way. Hananiah takes the yoke off Jeremiah's neck and smashes it to bits right there in front of everybody. And this is dramatic. This is a dramatic chapter. I mean, we got this, this dueling preaching going on, and then one preacher goes and grabs the yoke and smashes it. And I can imagine, because Jeremiah's been saying, you gotta submit to the, you gotta submit to the yoke of the king of Babylon. I can imagine as, as Hananiah grabs that yoke from Jeremiah, smashes it to the ground, I can imagine the crowd cheers, can't you? As they see that, that terrible thing around Jeremiah's neck smashed. What a scene. That must have been. <laughs> I'm not much of a fighter. I, I'm pretty even killed, as a matter of fact. My temper is pretty steady. But if somebody came up to me and did that, they're going to stop calling me the weeping prophet and start calling me the brawling prophet. <laughs> that was my object lesson, buddy. Instead, what happens? Jeremiah kept his cool. And he walks away. Leads to the second point that I want us to take this morning. Conflict can cloud our understanding of the truth. How easy would it have been to, to fight back? How easy would it have been to put that Gibeonite prophet in his place to show the crowd who's boss? Instead of a fight, though, Jeremiah does something that might actually be beneficial to all of us. He walked away. He walked away. I figure Jeremiah must have listened to Kenny Rogers before the conflict because he knew when to hold them, he knew when to fold them, he knew when to walk away, and he knew when to run. Jeremiah had a confidence that he was speaking the truth, and Hananiah wasn't. He had given his defense. He even acknowledged a willingness to be wrong so that the other guy could be right. But he knew that the only way that Hananiah would be put in his place would be for God's truth to continue to reveal itself. He made that point back in verse nine. He said, as a prophet who prophesies peace, when that word of peace, when that word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Have you ever been in that place before? So caught up in conflict that you lost sight of what you knew to be true. So caught up in the fight that you, you abandoned principles that you knew were, were bedrock. You look back at the conflict, you even found yourself saying things you regret, saying things that you didn't really believe. Jeremiah didn't engage in the conflict any further. He walked away. I don't think the Bible teaches us that we should walk away from every conflict. But the Bible does teach us that there are some we should walk away from. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, that there's a time to keep silence, and there's a time to speak. There's a time not to talk. And there's a time to talk. There's a time to engage the fight. And there's a time to walk away from the fight. Our problem is that we tend to err in the extreme on either side of that equation. We don't speak when we ought to. And we don't shut up when we've talked too much. You see, when we allow that conflict to simmer, we're not doing anybody any favors. We see this in church so much. People get hurt. They don't ever deal with the hurt. We were talking this week over dinner about some of the lyrics on uh, Taylor Swift's latest album. And uh, parents, just, just understand this. If you've not listened to the lyrics of that song, you probably, should, you probably should give some of her songs a listen to make sure that you're comfortable with, uh, with your children listening to what she's singing about. Um, because some of the lyrics in her music is openly hostile to the Christian faith. It, it, openly hostile, not, not like a, a, a passing jab or something like that, but, but openly hostile to the Christian faith. And I don't know if it's true or not, but you can't help but think that this young lady has got some deeply seated church hurt, that, that she was hurt somewhere along the way. She claims to be a Christian, but that somewhere along the way she was hurt, and that hurt's never been worked out, and she's working it out now actively in her songwriting career. And at what cost? as she writes about songs of hatred and songs of confusion. But then the other side of the equation could be just as dangerous. We don't know when to stay silent. We, we should be quiet, but we don't. 
It's like on, <laughs> it's like on social media. Here's a good rule of thumb, good, good practical principle for social media. If you're not posting recipes, vacation photos, and stories about your family doing things that we can all laugh about, just be quiet. Because you're not making friends by fussing on social media. You're not winning any converts to the faith by posting the latest and greatest conspiracy theory. And truth be told, you're not being a winsome witness to a lost and dying world by fighting with people over all the things that you learned in your personal echo chamber. You're not winning people to Christ. You're not winning people to your cause. You're not really doing anything except giving voice to things that are inside of you. You see, when we find ourselves in the midst of conflict, it's amazing how easily we can suspend our commitment to those things that we know to be true. I'm in a pastor's face, Facebook group, and presumably you would think that a group of pastors would understand how to treat one another. But introduce the topic that's controversial, and it turns into nasty immediately. It goes from, I disagree with your position, to your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberry. If you don't know that reference, then shame on you. If you do know it, then you get bonus points today. We can sacrifice principles for the simple sake of trying to win arguments. And Jeremiah teaches us that there are times that it's best to just walk away. There are times that it's best just to be quiet and not say anything else. Jeremiah knew to walk away. Now, he would eventually come back. But when he comes back, he doesn't come back to finish the fight. He doesn't come back having put together his foolproof argument of how he's going to hammer this guy and beat him into the ground and overcome him with his great argumentation. He comes back and he says exactly what God said, told him to say. No more and no less. In Jeremiah 28, 13, God says to Jeremiah, go tell Hananiah, Thus says the Lord, you have broken wooden bars, but you have made in their place bars of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put upon the neck of all these nations an iron yoke to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. For I have given to him even the beasts of the field. And Jeremiah the prophet said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You have made this people trust a lie. He didn't come settle the conflict with his own words. He came to tell him exactly what God said, exactly what God has been saying. He didn't, God didn't change his mind about anything. He didn't come up with a new point. He didn't come up with a new argument. He told him exactly what God said. Jeremiah knew that he could rest completely in God's words. He goes on in verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. In the same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. Wow. Hananiah was just trying to make everybody feel better. He was just trying to, to make everybody you know, feel good about things. We, we need to feel good about this circumstance. We, we're, we're Judah. We can beat Nebuchadnezzar. We can beat Babylon. We can push them back. He was just trying to cheer up the troops, raise morale, make everybody feel better about everything. But instead of rebelling against the king of Babylon, what God actually says to him is that you have rebelled against me because you knew what was true and you ignored it and you forsook it for the sake of whatever cause you thought you were representing. And all that points to this fundamental reality. What God says is true is always true. What God says is true is always true. How do you know the difference between what is true and what is make-believe? Just this. What God says is true is always true. You'll never find that God has spoken a word that isn't true. You'll never find that God has spoken a promise that he has ever broken. Every promise he's made, he keeps. Every word he speaks is true. 
Unfortunately for Hananiah, this meant that he wasn't long for this life. According to the math in this chapter, in chapter 28, it would appear that Hananiah died two months later. He showed up, he preached a bad sermon, tried to encourage the folks, tried to start a fight with Jeremiah, and within two months, he was dead. He was a false prophet. He was the very one that Jeremiah had cried out about in the previous chapter, and it turns out that he was judged for his deception. There are all sorts of things that can cloud our vision of the truth, and all those things revolve around our feelings and our emotions, but we need to understand this. The truth isn't worried about our feelings. The truth isn't concerned about our allegiances. The truth said there's a nail in your forehead regardless of how you feel about it. Our job is to make sure that we know what the truth is. Writer of Proverbs challenges in Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth, do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Our job is to make sure that we're shopping in the right store when we're buying it. Because there's all kinds of voices out there that are trying to sell you versions of the truth. There's all kinds of voices out there like Hananiah that's saying, don't listen to Jeremiah, ignore the gloom and doom of what he's saying. Listen to what I have to tell you, I've got a better message. It's the wrong store. You want to buy truth, don't buy what Hananiah is selling. You want to buy the truth, you better listen to what Jeremiah is saying because Jeremiah is speaking the truth. There's a lot of people out there today that claim to preach the Bible, but when you actually open the Bible and compare what they're saying to what it says, it doesn't often align all that well. Hananiah learned a really hard lesson. It cost him his life. We certainly don't see false teachers dropping dead today like you would have with Hananiah. But what we do see is a whole bunch of folks following them, hook, line, and sinker. We can rejoice today because God has given us his word. And because he's given us his word, we can evaluate all those claims that are from him and all those claims that are not. So we better make sure, though, that we buy, when we buy the truth, that we're shopping in the store that God has given to us so that we can know the difference. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that you speak with clarity with, in difficult matters. I thank you, Lord, that in spite of all of the emotions and feelings and all of the things that we hear today, that that which is true is not really all that concerned with how we feel about it. Not that you don't care about our feelings. Not that you don't care about our emotions, not that you don't care about those things. But Lord, that which is true is true whether we like it or not. Jeremiah didn't even like what he had to say. Jeremiah didn't even like that he had to speak these hard words. He even cried out at one point. He, he tried to keep those words in. He, he tried to hold them in. But the more he tried to hold in those words, the more they burnt inside of him. He could not not preach that which you had given him. Lord, he was committed to your word. And it would cost him dearly. But at the end of the day, he stood on that which was true. Lord, we live in a world that is greatly deceived in many ways. And we so often hear pundits and politicians and so many people that are pointing to problems and symptoms and all of these things, Lord, but really the ultimate problem in our day to day is that we as a nation have turned our back on the truth of your word and the truth of the gospel. We have a generation that's convinced that Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Wicca and all these other things are just all pathways that all lead to the same outcome. And Lord, there are people who believe that. But Lord, that contradicts what you said. 
You made it clear that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except through Jesus. You made it so clear to us, Lord. So why would we look in any other way? Why would we consider any other pathway if there's only one pathway that leads to you? That God let us not look anywhere else. Because that is true. And regardless of how it makes me feel, it is true. God, we recognize that there is, there is no name given unto men by which men can be saved that's not the name of Jesus. There's no other pathway to salvation apart from Christ. There's no other way to look at so much of what is wrong today and not see that it's a sin problem, not a law problem. It's a heart problem, not a politics problem. And so may we as your people be faithfully and firmly committed to your word, faithfully committed to the gospel, and may we courageously know when to speak and wisely know when to be silent. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for hard words from the scriptures. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.